one minute to freeze. Um, I wanted to check in before we start and just see if anyone has anything they need to announce. Thoughts, comments, questions? Perfect. I have, I have a quick announcement. Um, Bring it. OS, OS 400 team, I just sent you emails. We're going to be doing some one-on-one -on -one sessions on Wednesday. So you'll see a full schedule of what I'm doing. And it will hopefully be here and out on the 24th. Anybody else? I was just gonna show. There's online too here you. Oh then I've, okay. Let's see, what do I need to do here? Does that work? Yeah. Oh, that works. Okay. Um and then quick note to everyone, so there's an event that's happening here that's starting promptly at four. So we need to be um, sort of wrapped up and out pretty promptly at 10 of. We're going to try to hold folks outside until 10 of, um, but just be aware that there's going to be a pretty quick transition at the end here. Okay. Um, our speaker today, this is uh, an amazing and wild presentation. So in 2011, Matt Rutherford left Annapolis, Maryland to undertake and complete a nonstop single-handed voyage around North and South America. Over a 309 day odyssey that included cruising both the Northwest Passage and Cape Horn, he covered over 27,000 miles of ocean. This is boggling. Uh, upon returning from this circumnavigation, Matt started the Ocean Research Project, which is a collaborative nonprofit partnership focused on understanding human induced stress on the oceans. Working together with researchers, Ocean Research Project designs sailing expeditions that enable small core teams to gather critical data from remote and sensitive locations. The observations and results of these expeditions are creating a better understanding of critical factors impacting ocean health. Over the last 10 years, Matt has led expeditions to the Atlantic and the Pacific to collaborate on ocean plastics research as well as to the Arctic to study the impacts of climate change on the Greenland ice sheet. As Matt writes so eloquently, all life requires a healthy ocean to survive. With that as an introduction, I want to turn our presentation over to Mark Rutherford, who will be presenting here virtually. Take it away. How you guys doing? All right. Well, I wanted to be there in person. I'm um, sorry. We, I can't be. We, my organization has a microplastic project in the Chesapeake Bay in three days, and it's a big project, and it's just kind of taken over my life. But so what is Ocean Research Project? A very basic uh, explanation is that we are using sailboats as scientific data collection platforms. A traditional research vessel in the Arctic is about $50,000 a day. And uh, the Sekuliak, the research vessel in Alaska, that's the, the American research vessel, burns about 2,000 gallons of diesel every day. So a sailboat can operate at about 10% of the cost, and obviously we burn a, a very small fraction of the overall fuel. So how did this all start? So it started off, and I don't know how to even create an ocean research organization. I had to do, or I did, a nonstop single-handed circumnavigation of America. So in my case, how do you do it? I left out of Annapolis down here and I sailed north between Canada and Greenland through the Northwest Passage, the Canadian Arctic. You pop out above Alaska. You got to go around the state of Alaska, all the way down the Pacific, around Cape Horn and back to the Chesapeake Bay. It is just that simple, folks. It was 27,077 nautical miles and nonstop means nonstop. You do not drop an anchor. You do not connect to anything that is connected to the ground. You cannot run aground. You have to remain a vessel underway according to the international rules of maritime navigation. Um, so you sail in your sleep, you're always sailing essentially. And uh, a lot of the inspiration from this came from my heroes. My heroes were people like Shackleton and Amundsen, some of the great polar explorers. And then later on when I got into sailing, I didn't grow up sailing. Uh, people like Knox Johnson, who is the first person to ever sail alone around the world without stopping. So this was my boat. 
this picture is to scale. That is a joke, by the way. Um, it's not much. Uh, you can walk past an all 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 it was very hard to get sponsorship and funding for this trip. And uh, I just had to make do with what I could get. And what I could get was a $5,000, 1971, 27 foot boat, had about five foot seven headroom. I couldn't stand up in a boat without hitting my head. I couldn't walk really for 309 days. Um, lost a bit of muscle in my legs, but anyways, that is the vessel. So you got to sail up to the Arctic first. One of the big challenges probably the most challenging part of this entire voyage outside of just solitude and dealing with that is a combination of fog and icebergs. And I didn't have a radar. I would have loved to have had a radar. We just couldn't raise the money. But when a wave crashes up against a big giant iceberg in the fog, it sounds like thunder. So if you hear some thunder, you know, in front of you, maybe you should turn to port or turn to starboard. But these big guys drop small pieces of ice off of them, and they're just right below the surface, hiding like a submerged container. And that's the real threat. And so you're often sitting out there. I'm, I'm in the cockpit, completely exposed to the elements, and uh, you're just trying to dodge whatever ice comes out of the fog. And uh, there's a lot of sleep deprivation. I think I lost about 30 pounds uh, in the time it took me to get through the Northwest Passage. But at the same time, I really enjoyed being up there. I felt like I was walking in the footsteps of some of my heroes, some of the great explorers. And, you know, you could be cold and wet and, and you know, and miserable and, and complain, and it's not going to help you. So you might as well just have a good attitude. So even though I was cold and I was wet and I was hungry and all this other stuff, I was living off of freeze-dried food. I had 700 pounds of freeze-dried food. Um, I was really excited to be up there. I felt like a kid in Disneyland. So you get a lot of bad weather up there. It seems to be all or nothing in the Arctic, more or less. Not always, but often you get either really, really light wind that can last for like a week straight. And then you get a storm that just blows the oysters off the rocks. And there's not often a lot in between. You don't get a lot of that like 15 to 20 knot nice breezes. Uh, it's sort of all or nothing. Of course, the water itself is right above freezing. I mean, it's literally ice cold water. And so if you put your hand in it, you'll get a burning sensation instead of a cold sensation. And it's just another element. You're in the cockpit, you got a tiller in your hand and you're just getting blasted by wave after wave after wave. But you know, what you gonna do? I mean, that's just the way it is up there. So I went through, you know, got through the Northwest Passage and I popped out above Alaska and started making into the Bering Sea. And I thought, all right, I'm in a Bering Sea. I'm, I'm out of the Arctic Ocean. I, uh, but the Bering Sea is a nasty body of water. Uh, I got hit by a rogue wave at one point. It flipped my boat upside down. Uh, it did flip back over again. Obviously, I'm alive. Um, but the Bering Sea is just a nasty, nasty place. I had a little bit of damage, but it wasn't too bad. I could continue on my voyage. Eventually, things warm up, and you're starting to get into the the uh, you know the Pacific Ocean, and and then you get into the trade winds. There's a very large easterly trade wind bank. And it's great if you want to go through the Panama Canal and sail to Tahiti or Fiji, but it's pretty terrible if you're trying to get to Cape Horn because you have to beat into the wind. So for 41 days, I had to beat into the wind. I actually, uh, an old depth sounder transducer started to leak, and my bilge pumps had both broken at that point. So I, for the last 16,000 miles, I'd have bailed my boat out with an empty can of corn in a three-gallon bucket because that was the only thing that would fit in the tiny bilge of that little boat. But, you know, I mean, it is what it is. It keeps you busy at the very least. And every eight hours or so, I had to bail my boat out or my floorboards would start floating. But, you know, eventually you get further south and now you got a different problem. So the Southern Ocean has all sorts of nicknames like a Roaring 40s and Furious 50s. And they have that for a good reason. We do not have those nicknames in the Northern Hemisphere. But the Southern Hemisphere has a lot more ocean and a lot less land. And these storms are massive. And if you look at Cape Horn, uh, below Cape Horn is the Antarctic Peninsula, 
and there's only about 600 miles in between them. So all this action funnels into this area that's of only about 600 miles, and it gets just absolutely terrible. So I had four storms uh, like this that maybe lasted 24 to 48 hours, maybe 70 hours each, and you know, 25, 30 foot waves. But I was pretty used to it at this time. Of course, it would knock the boat around, but none of these flipped the boat upside down like in the Bering Sea. So it was rough, but you know, manageable. This down here in the bottom is Cape Horn. Uh, you can see there is some wave action around the horn. I think it was only blowing about 30 knots that day, which is pretty nice for Cape Horn. So I had a pretty good passage when I went around it. I made my way back up the Atlantic Ocean. My boat was falling apart, but I made it. And then right before I got back, this is my boat. I did not know it had all that stuff on the hull. I had no idea. I'm not like leaning over the side of the boat looking at my hull. Um, and uh, that day 308... I can see the finish line and the wind died and my engine was broken and it had been broken for a long time. And uh, it almost, the, the current almost pushed me on a beach right next to the finish line. After 308 days, I almost got shipwrecked within sight of the finish line. But luckily after fighting the, the, the current all night with just a little bit of wind, the wind picked up, made it through the Chesapeake Bay and became the first person in history to do a nonstop single-handed circumnavigation of North and South America. Made a film about it called Red Dot on the Ocean. If you want to see it, it's on Amazon. It's on YouTube. It's been on PBS for the last 10 years or something. And so I took the momentum from that and I created the nonprofit. So this was our first research vessel. Uh, looks pretty nice in this picture, but it didn't start off that way. I didn't have any money coming back from that trip. So I just bought whatever I could buy. This is what it looked like when I got the boat. It was completely rotten decks, tons of issues with rust, had to do 13 patches below the waterline, obviously ripped the entire deck off. But, you know, that's how it is. Sometimes you just got to gather what you got. And I didn't have a lot of money, but we, you know, we needed a research boat. I couldn't wait around for somebody to donate a research boat at that point because it, I don't know when that's going to happen. I just had to get something so we could get started. Now, initially, before the Arctic, we were working in the Atlantic and the Pacific doing microplastics. When I was sailing around the Americas, I would fish. And, you know, it's, they say it's like six o'clock at night. And, you know, the sun is going down a little bit. You don't want to eat freeze dried food again. You've been eating freeze dried food for like 200 days or something, you know? And you hear your fishing reel start to buzz. That bzzz, like, oh my God, I got a fish. So you go out there, you grab your rod, your reel. No, it's, it's heavy. I got something heavy. But it's not fighting, right? And you're, you're a little worried that it's not fighting, but whatever, I got a fish, I got a fish. You bring it back to the boat and it's a trash bag. And for every one fish that I caught, I caught at least 10 pieces of plastic trash. So it was something that really bothered me. So we also didn't have the money necessary to do Arctic research at this point. Uh, we started the nonprofit from scratch. We'd, we never got any seed money. We never got any big donations. We just had to make do with what we could. And these were projects that, that we could pull off financially until we got uh, more evolved and we could head back up to the Arctic. So in this picture, you see a W looking shape on the bottom. Um, this is a 2,600 mile W and that's the Eastern side of the North Atlantic garbage patch. Nobody had mapped that part of the, of the Atlantic garbage patch in 2013. So we went out there and mapped it. It's about 160,000 pieces per square kilometer, generally speaking a lot of it. There is no island of garbage in the ocean. It's uh, more of a soup. It's the small pieces integrated with the ocean. If there was an island of garbage, it'd be a lot easier to deal with. You get like a freighter and a giant net and try to like scoop it up, but it's integrated into the ocean. It's almost impossible to clean it up. And I know there's some organizations that have been trying and, and failing to do that. I think it's a bit of a lost cause personally. Uh, we need to fight the battle on land, in my opinion. You know, we need to interact with this one time, with this material in a more responsible manner. So the next year, we were going to go into the Pacific, but my boat was in the Atlantic. So I convinced a boat company to let us take their brand new 29-foot boat across the Pacific. They would get some PR out of it, and we would have a boat to do more research in the Pacific garbage patch. The boat was supposed to be finished, but, oh, wait, we found an abandoned ship. Forgot to say that. <laughs> This abandoned ship was in the middle of the Atlantic garbage patch. It's a 48 foot swan. We tried to tow it, it became a nightmare. But anyways, we wanted to do work in the Pacific. We're supposed to show up and the boat was supposed to be ready. And this was the boat. 
Uh, obviously, this boat is not anywhere near being finished. So it's supposed to take 12 weeks to build the boat. Uh, we built it in 23 days. I was became the biggest volunteer in the world for this company, essentially. And uh, I was working like 18 hour days trying to build this thing all day and all night. And eventually after 23 days, we got the boat finished and off we went. So this passage was uh, from San Francisco to Yokohama, Japan, nonstop. It was, took us about 64 days to cross the Pacific, uh, 7,000 miles uh, passage. And what we were looking at this time is the, the, there's easterly trade winds and currents just south of the Pacific garbage patch. And we're trying to better understand how the, the garbage patch is located about here, if you can see my cursor. Um, it, we're trying to see how the easterly winds and currents are moving plastic from the garbage patch, kind of like a conveyor belt to different parts of the ocean. And we ended up publishing a paper with the University of uh, Tokyo. Uh, took about a year to publish the paper, but that's the way it works when it comes to publishing scientific papers. So we wanted to get north. The organization was getting a little more established. And um, and this is, this is a trawl. This is what the device looks like that you pull through the water, you pitch it off the side of your boat. It has to be in clean water that's not being affected by the wake of your boat. This is what you get. You can see all these little pieces of plastic in here. You know, I mean, there's a ton of, I don't know, hundreds of pieces of plastic. This thing is not very wide. The mouth of this is only a couple of feet and you're getting all of this in two miles. We trawl for two miles and this is how much you get. I mean, it's crazy amount of, and this is the garbage patch. This is what it looks like. It's not an island. It looks like that. So we also do microplastics in the Arctic and we just published a paper about nine months ago with some of the stuff we've been doing up there. Uh, but we also wanted to start focusing more on glaciers, glacial melt, and the changing climate. The glaciers are melting. And uh, we finally got ourselves together. We could get back up to the Arctic. So here's a beautiful day in the ocean, but this is what it's like. You want to cross uh, the Labrador Sea? I know you guys have a boat, the boat, and it's going to be heading up there. Well, I mean, you can sail from Maine to uh, Newfoundland and or Nova Scotia, then Newfoundland. It's not that bad. But when you leave Newfoundland, you got to cross the Labrador Sea. And it is a nasty body of water on a good day. You just can't avoid it. So mostly 2015 and 16, I'm going to talk a little bit about these expeditions. Obviously, it's just completely unbelievably beautiful up there. What we were doing, this is our path. We mostly focused on the areas in central, southern central, and uh, um, northern Greenland. So here's a better uh, example. You can see these boxes, the two boxes. So what we were doing, there is a warmer, saltier water column coming up from the ocean and melting Greenland's glaciers from underneath. So we have to verify its existence in two ways. One, by mapping the seafloor to find the deeper areas because this water is about 270 meters deep, roughly. And here's a, here's a close up of that lower box. As you lower the CTD, you see the blue line. The blue line goes down. That represents the CTD going down through the water. But the green line, the temperature goes up. It's the opposite of what you would think. You think the water on the surface is the warmest water and it gets colder as it gets deeper. Well, you have water columns, and within these water columns, you have different things happening. And in a water column, roughly 270 meters down, it actually gets warmer. If you have an area that goes from the open ocean to the glacier face, and it continuously keeps a depth of roughly 270 meters or deeper, then that glacier could be affected by that warmer water. So this is Smith Sound, this is further north. You can actually see it a bit better. You can see the spike uh, of the green line and that's it passing through the warmer water column and then dropping out the other side where then it gets colder again. So we were essentially chasing this warmer water column. We were working with a NASA group called Ocean Melting Greenland and that was 2015. You can see the route, that's the same picture as this essentially, just with our actual route. These are all CTD locations, the white dots, the blue line is where we were. But to give you a better idea of what that really looks like, this is what it really looks like. This is the satellite picture of that same thing. You start push, pushing into the ice up here, 
the ice is only going to let you go so far. And in the center of this icy picture, the top of the picture, you, no sailboat is going to be messing around in there. You better have an icebreaker if you're up there. I mean, it's you're getting to the point of being impenetrable. So 2016, we focused on the same area. You see the picture on the left of Greenland, wave northwest. This is a close-up of that box right here. And this area is about half the size of the Chesapeake Bay. So it's a massive, massive place, completely uncharted. And all these lines were transects that we did. Now, we were using a single beam sonar at this time. The single beam sonar was about $20,000. A multi-beam sonar is about $250,000. So again, we're still trying to develop the organization. A single beam is a lot more work. It's like trying to paint a wall with like a tiny watercolor paintbrush, where a multi-beam is like a paint roller, you know? Not to mention with a single beam, you have to create models from your information. Where with a multi-beam, you get a true 3D picture of the seafloor. So anyways, this was the area and all these red dots were our CTDs. I think we did like 140 of them that year alone. And uh, the Atlantic water, the warmer water column is getting in here and it is melting these glaciers from underneath. And we also discovered that you can have a sill underwater, like a shallower area. Let's say the shallower area goes to 200 meters. Well, sometimes the warmer water can push up and go over the top and down the bottom side and get to glaciers that we originally thought were protected from this water column. So it's getting into places that we didn't originally think it could get to. And um, obviously that just speeds up the, the rate of the glacial melt. Now, these currents have been here for, I'm guessing, 3 million years. It was roughly 3 million years when Panama came up out of the uh, ocean and created a different current structure uh, in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And of course, the Gulf Stream is the spinoff. Now, if the water is getting warmer, well, that means the water that's getting up to the glaciers is also getting warmer. It can be sometimes, you know, three, four, five, six, seven degrees warmer. Further south, it could be seven degrees. And that's a big difference. So I show you this picture, great. You got a picture, you see a bunch of dots and lines and whatnot, but it doesn't really show you what it's like to work in this area. So in a moment, I'm gonna show you a video. It's about three minutes long and it just has some music over it and footage of us doing research. But the video I'm gonna show you is this area. And then you can see what these conditions are really like. I mean, it is full of ice. We had five terrible storms that year. Uh, one of them blew hurricane force, uh, blew us off our anchor. Uh, it was it was sketchy, but that's what you get up here. This is the Arctic. You know, you you don't have nobody up there to help you. You're on your own, and you need to be prepared for it the best you can be. So yes, it's a beautiful place to be. But I'll show you this video, and it is a little bit louder, so you might want to adjust the volume on this one. And this is the worst picture of me ever, by the way. I didn't know how to get rid of it, so now we all get to see it. <laughs> you can't unsee it now. All right, here you go.
hopefully that thing wasn't glitching as bad for you guys as it looked like it might have been, but uh, it does at least give you some idea of what it's like up there. So, you know, it was it was a good expedition. Again, we were working with that NASA Ocean Melting Greenland group, and we were able to get a lot done. Um, it was a very hard trip, that one in particular. Like I said, we had five storms, and, and the one storm that blew us off the anchor, I you know, I, I almost had a mutiny. I had uh, my first mate panicked. He was trying to get into the life raft. Uh, he was getting everybody into the, uh, what, what I call Gumby suits. They're immersion suits. Um, if you get into an immersion suit, I don't know if you guys have ever tried to put one on, but you're basically useless. It's hard to do anything. Uh, you know, and, and I'm telling everybody, now we need to, we need to get in our foul weather gear. We got to fight this. We can't give up. Getting in a life raft would have been a ridiculous idea. I mean, there was ice all over the place and it was blowing 80, 90 knots. I mean, you just, you're just going to get thrown up against an iceberg. It's going to destroy the life raft and everybody's going to die. So it was a very sketchy thing. I was able to keep control of the ship, but only by a small fraction. And this guy was quite a bit bigger than I was physically, but luckily I was able to keep everything under control. We made it through the storm and, uh, you know, nobody got hurt. The boat was okay. Uh, but there's a whole nother aspect, a uh, psychological aspect of going to somewhere like the Arctic. Uh, how are you going to behave or how is it going to affect you if you get yourself into a real life and death situation? Are you going to panic? Uh, are you going to find that strength inside yourself? Um, it's different for everybody. And if you've never had a, a real situation where you're like, oh, my God, I might die. Oh, my God, I might die in 20 minutes. Um, you know, it's hard to know how you're going to get affected by that. But regardless of the terrible storm and all the rest, uh, we were able to finish the project and successfully. And, and, um, and I, you know, it was a real good, solid expedition and, and I'm really glad we made it. But the other problem was however much, you know, I liked that research boat. It really, well, it wasn't a great boat, to be honest with you. I mean, first off it sailed like a well-trimmed refrigerator. Uh, it was a horrible sailing boat. It was a cat rig schooner. If you look at the rig, there's just two mainsails, essentially. I did add a bowsprit. You could kind of add a jib, but those are unstayed masts. There are no wires that hold those masts up. Um, it's like a freedom, if you're familiar with sailboats, kind of. But we got back and, you know, the engine was old and it was, by, by the time I got back to Annapolis, Maryland, I mean, it was basically broken. We had to get rid of the boat. It, it wasn't, we, you know, I have already done major refits. It wasn't the right boat. And it was, it was a hard time. How do you have a research organization without a research vessel? Like, what are you going to do? And um, in 2018, we ended up jumping on somebody else's uh, research vessel and um, going into the Northwest Passage. And we did a good project, but it's not the same. You, you can't bring all your scientific equipment and it's not your boat. You're not going to push into the ice. And the, and that boat was fiberglass. At least this boat down here is metal. And that makes a pretty big difference too. Although I will say that the Titanic was made of steel. So having a steel boat helps, but obviously if you hit something big enough, hard enough, you're going to sink. You have about 10 minutes that you can survive in that water before you go into shock and die. So it's, you know, you got to treat the water like hot lava. If somebody falls off the boat up there, they may or may not be able to, you might be, not be able to turn around and pick them up in time. I mean, you, hopefully you can, but that's why you got to use harnesses, tethers. That's why people have to stay attached to the vessel. So we went up in 2018, did some research, came back. I got really fortunate. I found somebody to donate a 70-foot steel schooner. The problem was, it was... Sorry about that. The problem was it was half built and it was abandoned for 18 years. So the, the guy built the boat in 2000, uh, professionally built the hull, but it never got finished. And it was in terrible shape <laughs> to say the least, but I saw the potential in the boat. So this is the galley before, this is the galley after. Now you can see the floor is still, you know, and the ceiling and the floor are not done. The room behind me is not done, but you get a general idea. This, the whole boat essentially looks like this now. Uh, it took me two years to build the interior of the boat. I, the boat had never sailed. I had to redo everything, every system, everything you can imagine. 
I did it during the pandemic. So when most people were doing social distancing in the pandemic, I was building a research boat in a boat yard. It was the loneliest boat yard you have ever seen, but at least I was busy. So here's a boat in the end. Looks pretty good now. 2022, 2023, we got a bigger boat. We got better equipment, getting back up into Greenland. This is like a whole new chapter for the organization. We're now we got a professional vessel, professional equipment. All right, let's go. So this picture over here of Greenland, I know it's sideways, it's a little confusing. We've been working quite a bit in Southwest Greenland, uh, a bit in the central part of Greenland, and then in the Northwest Passage where the other uh, little red box is. And these little uh, sampling periods you see to the right of it, uh, this is the surface melt. So we try to get up there to catch uh, before the peak melt, during the peak melt, and after the peak melt. So on the bottom, these are the different types of glaciers. On the left, you'll see a healthy, what I call a healthy glacier. This is an ocean terminating glacier, has an ice shelf. And then you got next to it, a glacier that's starting to retreat. You can see little bits of land at the bottom of it. It doesn't have an ice shelf anymore. Next to that is a glacier that's melted, but there's still a river. It, it leaves a river of like muddy water, essentially, uh, that fills the fjord full of mud, which makes it very difficult for photosynthesis to occur for any biological activity. Uh, it's like plankton. And then on the last picture is a deglaciated fjord that's been deglaciated for a long time and it doesn't have the river anymore. These are basically the four stages of a glacier going from healthy to dying to dead to very, very dead. All right. So ocean terminating glacier, this is the healthy glacier. This is what we want in the Arctic. So the red line, this is the ocean water, the water I talked about earlier, that warmer water column. And it also brings in some of the nutrients. You have glacial discharge, glacial discharge is obviously coming off the glacier. There's a river of melted water under the glacier. Now these two meet, and when they meet, they create upwelling. They create a lot of activity. It's this symbiotic relationship. It releases nutrients. There's nutrients coming from under the glacier, nutrients coming from the ocean, comes together, meets with photosynthesis. This is very important for phytoplankton. If you have these big blooms of phytoplankton, you need all these different nutrients. You need the photosynthesis. You need this synergy of all these different things working together. The icebergs themselves actually help mix it up. Icebergs have a little current around them. They move around. They kind of stir the pot at the surface a bit. And so all this is healthy. But what happens over time is that red ocean current passes the, the, the glacial current, and it starts to eat the glacier from underneath. And over time, this just gets worse and worse. And this is one of the factors. Obviously, there's more than just this factor. But this is one of the factors that leads to this deglaciation. Now, you see the blue line up top. That blue line is the glacial discharge. It's no longer interacting with the warm water from the ocean. And now you got a problem. You're no longer getting the nutrients in this fjord. So we now have a multi-beam sonar. We're not using a single beam anymore, thank God. And, uh, and multi-beams are really the way to go, uh, nevertheless. But they're really expensive. They're hard to use. It's like having a Lamborghini. You know, it's expensive. It's hard to use. It's a lot of maintenance. Uh, but this is an example of one fjord that we have mapped. So you'll see right here, there's a sill, if you can see my white cursor. That sill is where the glacier maximum was during the last ice age. It pushed all the sediment from the fjord to that point. On the other side of the fjord, you have where the glacier used to be. Now this is a deglaciated fjord, but this is basically what it looks like when you map an uncharted fjord. It's uncharted. You see that red line next to the S in fjords, that red little bump? That is sticking right up, right below the surface. I can hit that, and if I hit that, I'll punch a hole in my boat and I will sink, and it'll be very, very, very bad. So this is one of the things about mapping these uncharted areas. They're uncharted. You have no idea where the rocks are. You have no idea where these, these points, these pinnacles that come up right below the surface. And you have to pay very close attention because again, you are in the middle of nowhere and there's nobody around. And mapping the seafloor is, it's a very important thing for understanding what's happening. So if you wanna know what's happening with a glacier and a fjord, 
okay, you can look at it from the surface, you can look at it from a satellite, you can look at it from, you know, standing on land. But if you don't understand the subsurface, if you don't understand what's happening underwater, you're not going to have a full picture of how that glacier is interacting with that fjord. You need to have a full understanding. It's like if you want to paint a painting, you need to have a canvas. This is just like primal, basic knowledge that is critical to understanding the glacier, how it's interacting with the fjord. You can see how it's retreated over time since the last ice age. So it gives you a lot of really important information. This is not for mining. We're not looking for oil. This is not for navigation. This is purely for science. And this is a last little video I want to show you. This video, uh, hopefully it doesn't glitch on your side. I don't know. But uh, this is Nicole. Nicole is our scientist. In order for us to have an ocean research organization, we have to have scientists that work in the organization. Collecting the data is just part of it. You are There are four steps in doing research, like professional scientific research. You first have to figure out where are the gaps in the knowledge? Where is it that we're missing this information? And that means you got to read a lot of scientific papers. You got to go through it. You got to talk to other scientists. And then you find out where the gaps are. It could be anything from an uncharted fjord to some aspect of understanding the interactions of a glacier and plankton. But whatever it is, you got to figure that out first. The second part, you got to collect the data. And, you know, that's pretty obvious. Going around, mapping this, that, and the other. You know, we do we do water. We did 600 water samples last year. We did 20 core samples last year. There's a combination of physical samples and uh, database samples. We have a flow through system with a lot of different sensors in it. We're doing a lot of different things, basically. But you have to process all that data. One core can cost $7,000 to process, and we had 20 of them. So in every 600 water samples, got to process that. So there's all this back, you know, all this background stuff that happens when the expedition is over really the science is just starting because then you got to be in a lab and you got to process and then the last part of course is publishing the scientific paper that and it's a peer-reviewed scientific paper and that answers that shows the proof that you have answered the scientific question you went from where is the gaps all the way to finding the gaps and answering whatever the scientific question was that you were trying to figure out through this entire process so anyways, this little video, it's about two minutes long. Nicole did it, who's our scientist, and um, it's just about mapping. And it also shows you a little more from what it actually looks like up there in this part of Greenland. Every year, the Arctic's ice-covered oceans shrink, revealing uncharted navigable waters. These waterways, once frozen year-round, now beckon a new age of exploration. Each summer, Ocean Research Project sails north observing and mapping the marine environment before extreme temperatures further devastate the polar region. There's a poetry to ocean mapping. The sailors swiftly navigate the polar waters in a complex dance, avoiding collision with nature's obstacles. Towering icebergs, hidden rocks, fog, wind, and waves all accompany the boat on an exhilarating performance across the coastal Arctic. Armed with the best in mapping technology, Oceanographers tune the multi-beam sonar like a master musician, sending millions of sound waves from fingertip to seafloor. While those sound waves bounce off the ocean's bottom, satellites pass overhead, remotely guiding the ship's course and perfecting each depth sounding position. As the new ocean map begins to emerge, ancient markings and features tell of colder times during the last glacial maximum. By expanding coverage of the Arctic seafloor, climate models can better predict the pace of sea level rise and impacts from the warming of our planet. With over half of our planet's oceans uncharted and Earth's polar ice cap rapidly receding, mapping at the edges of the Earth is more important now than ever. The good news? We're up to the challenge. All right. So, any questions? I think we got about 10 minutes. Okay. Let me see. Is there... Can you hear me? 
Hello, I have a question regarding uh, plankton diversity in Arctic. Is there any noticeable differences in the diversity of phytoplankton populations um, inside and outside of the fjords? Um, well, first off, just to let you guys all, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm not the scientist, but I'll do my best to, to, to answer these uh, questions. I think as far as the, the relationship between the fjord and the, and the, the phytoplankton itself, uh, phytoplankton is fed in some ways by the nutrients that come off, you know, that the mixing of the two together, the large phytoplankton blooms are, are not going to be like densely in the fjord. You know, all these fjords end up pushing all of this out into places like Baffin Bay, for instance, or Disco Bay or Labrador Sea or whatever it is. Um, and so you get blooms that are more close to the uh, coastline. Um, then within the fjord, you know, within the, there is plankton in the fjords, but I think the big concentrations are going to be uh, a little further outside. But, you know, the concern is that if too many glaciers become land fast and they're no longer able to produce these, this nutrients and this upwelling and this activity, how is that going to affect the plankton on a larger scale within the Arctic? And nobody really knows exactly, but I, I would imagine it's not going to be good. Thank you very much. That's a game show in reverse. Do you have any recommendations for the Ocean Studies students that will be sailing on Bowdoin to the Arctic this summer? Um, I hope to talk to him soon. Uh, I wanted to, I, I talked with the captain and I was going to come in and, and do a little uh, Q&A with the, with the people going up. I'm going to still try to do something through the video. Um, you know, it, it depends on what you guys would like to do as far as uh, projects go. I don't know what kind of equipment you might have on the boat or have access to, but um, I'm sure there could be some projects that we could pull together uh, if you guys were interested in that sort of thing. But being that, you know, it's not primarily a research vessel, you know, you're going to be somewhat limited. But there are projects. And if you guys are interested, you know, let me know and I can put you in touch with the scientist and we can try to figure something out. Thank you. Yep. Hello. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first is, what is your primary source of funding now? And the second question is, what advice would you give to someone who's also interested in engaging uh, in research, utilizing a sailboat, and getting started in that space at this point? Uh, funding is very difficult. Uh, it's been extremely painful over the years. And we've did expeditions in the past on absolute shoestrings, which is just really difficult. But over time, it does get better. I mean, primarily, it's a combination of public funding. that just, you know, that grows over time as your organization gets better known. And also uh, more traditional scientific grants. So as an ocean research nonprofit, you have two separate, well, really three separate pools of money that you have to get. One of them is just research money, right? Like how do you fund the expedition? So to get expedition funding, you're gonna be looking at more traditional grants and grant writing combined with whatever other funding you can pull together. But there's also the administrative part of a nonprofit, like an office, and there's the boat and boats are expensive. You know, I mean, a 72 foot boat, the sails, on that boat are $70,000 just for the sales. So, and that's a different money and you're not gonna get that money through traditional grant writing, you know? And grants don't like to cover salary. So you're not gonna pay your crew with the money from a scientific grant. They only let you pay your like five or 8% or 10% salary. So yeah, it's, it's brutal. And as far as starting your own organization, you know, you gotta, you need to be able to sail the boat, ideally. You know, if you could get to a point where you can captain your own vessel, 
you need to be able to get your hands on a sailboat. I would certainly start small, you know, or smaller. Uh, I did a lot of sailing before we started with the plastics project and uh, worked my way up to it. But you, you got to be ready for a long grind unless you come from a situation where you have access to a lot of money. Uh, if you're a normal, you know, from a normal financial background, uh, it's going to be a grind and it's going to it's going to suck because you're going to get a lot more no's than you're going to get yeses. And you're going to fail probably 80 to 90 percent of the time to get funding. So you just got to get used to failing and you just never give up. Thank you very much. Thanks for the talk. That's really uh, fascinating. Great, great videos and great pictures. Uh, I'm curious if you have uh, done any more work with plastics, um, especially up in the Arctic, or if there are plans to. Um, and specifically, how how small uh, of a mesh size are you using to find those plastics that you showed? Yeah. So microplastic data collection has changed a bit over time, uh, especially since 2013. Uh, a couple of different things have happened, uh, one of which is uh, somewhere around 2015 or 16, uh, some Spanish scientists published a paper saying that a lot of the plastic trash in the ocean is missing. And what they mean by missing is it's not on the surface. So it could be anywhere between 70 and 90 percent of the plastic trash is actually not on the surface. It's either in a different water column or it's on the on the seafloor. So, you know, cleaning the surface of the ocean does something, but it's it, it's just going to do a, a small part. Now, we're about to start in three days a Chesapeake Bay microplastics project where we're going to every single river in the Chesapeake Bay, including the top, the bottom, and a bunch of transects in the middle looking for microplastics. But you're not going to find what I call oceanic microplastics, which is what you saw in those pictures, those pieces of plastic that break down to the size of your fingernail or smaller. It's just not going to happen there. The plastic's not out there long enough. It's, it's just, you know, it's just that environment will have it. So what the focus of microplastics is today more so, particularly in places like uh, the Hudson River and New York, the Chesapeake Bay, or even a garbage patch or the Arctic, is microfibers. Because we're learning more and more that there are smaller pieces of microplastics that are getting into everything. I mean, everything. I read something the other day that they're finding it in the plaque in people's hearts when they give them open heart surgery. They find it in bottled water. They find it in a beer. You know, they've taken beers off the shelf and found microfibers of plastic. If you have a fleece jacket and you wash it, you can release up to 60,000 microfibers washing a fleece just one time. And it gets through the filtration systems. It gets in everything. So also looking at microplastics vertically instead of just the surface. Try and get a surface sample Try to get something down deeper, whatever. It depends on your capabilities, you know, 50 feet, 100 feet, whatever you can do, depending on what you have. But we're going more into looking for microfibers and microplastics. So I think, I'm trying to remember the mill. That was called a manta net, by the way, that you saw us trolling. There's a couple of different types of trolls out there. It was pretty small, but definitely not small enough for microfibers. So our flow-through system that we've installed on our boat for this plastics, this is the second time we've done this microfiber uh, plastics project in the Chesapeake. We did it last fall. Uh, we have a 50 micron uh, sieve and we have a 100 micron sieve and we have a 500 micron sieve to catch sort of the different sizes. But it's the, the manta nets are, I mean, they're tiny. I mean, you know, they're probably something in the 500 micron, you know, maybe they're less than a millimeter. Um, and you get all sorts of weird stuff. My, our scientist in 2013 got a man of war jellyfish in her eyeball because we caught man of wars in there and she got man of war in her eyeball. Her eyeball swelled up for like three days and we're in the middle of the ocean. It was terrible. But uh, anyways, yeah, people are focusing more on microfibers because they're everywhere, essentially. Awesome. Well, I would love to keep asking questions, but we're going to need to wrap this up. So let's give everybody, let's give Matt another hand. And, and thank you so much, Matt, for being our first speaker for this semester. <laughs>